So let's get started. Next speaker is Peter Liu. And he's been talking, um, so he's a postdoc researcher at Harvard, and he will be talking to us about desktop supercomputing in the soft matter physics laboratory. And I'm really excited to have you here and give us a good talk. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, to our session chair, uh, Timo, and uh, for all of you for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit differently than a lot of some of the other presentations where they're going to this limit of very large computing resources in the cloud. And this is sort of maybe looking at it a slightly different way. What can we do when we bring this uh, intense amount of computing power into the laboratory and uh, in particular close to the data? So uh, the things that I'm talking about, you can find more information on my webpage at peterlew.org. All right, so I think I want to start by talking a little bit about the NVIDIA sort of product line and how we're using different uh, instantiations or implementations of the GPU for different kinds of roles, and they're all contributing to different parts of the science pipeline. So in terms of conceiving experiments and doing the engineering to build it, uh, we use a lot of Quadro for mechanical engineering designs. Uh, when it comes to executing or collecting data, I'll tell you a little bit about how we can use Tegra and very lightweight processors to do different kinds of collecting of data, bringing computing power to where traditionally there might not be any. And then for more of the traditional laboratory-based uh, analysis, uh, we rely pretty heavily on Tesla and CUDA. And then finally, uh, I'm presenting, although it turns out my, my personal laptop is an ION, and I really like using that, but in this case, uh, they have such a a good HD uh, framework here that we decided to go with the laptop here, which is running a Quadro. So we're using different GPUs, uh, I think, for lots of different purposes, but they're all contributing to enable us to do what, what we feel is some interesting new science. So I'm going to tell you about three stories, uh, different projects that we've been working on in the lab over the past couple of years. And the first one is something that we call confocal differential dynamic microscopy. And it's how we're using Tesla and the CUDA libraries to interactively explore the real-time dynamics of evolving microsystems. So that's a lot of words. And what exactly do I mean by that? Well, if we want to understand things about physics from looking at microscopic motion, this actually has a very long history. So if we go back to the 1820s when uh, Robert Brown first observed the diffusion of pollen grains in a microscope. So you might be familiar with the term Brownian motion. And so you see these little guys bouncing around. And he made that observation in the 1820s. But this is deeply connected with the history of statistical physics, because in 1905, Albert Einstein and uh, later some others elaborating came up with a way to explain this very simply with the diffusion equation. So if we start out with microscopic observations, we can actually learn things that are pretty interesting about physics. And there's an almost 200-year history of this happening. All right, so let me introduce to you a technique called confocal microscopy, where basically what you do is take an image and you move and refocus a microscope. And this technique allows you to just slice an image. And you can build up these three-dimensional reconstructions. So here's a system of particles. And we've done this three-dimensional reconstruction. And now we collect the data and then do the reconstruction on the CPU. This is, this is some older work. And then what we can actually do is calculate where the particles are, what the biggest cluster is, calculate that cluster's center of mass, and then adjust the microscope's uh, electrical drive to keep that cluster in the center of the field of view. So you'll see a little video in the upper right-hand corner. And then in the lower right, there's the position of the center of that cluster based on where the microscope moves to keep it centered. Now we color the clusters by the number of particles. We can see other clusters coming in. So this is something about five, six years ago that we worked on doing it on the CPU. And it's nice because we can capture the full dynamics of these systems and um, you know, get real-time full 3D information. But there are, of course, uh, yeah, so, so in this sort of traditional usage of confocal microscopy, well, what do we have? We have very good spatial resolution. We can look at these particles, which are about a micron in size, and find their three-dimensional position within, say, 50 nanometers. But the, the trade-off here is low time resolution. So I was showing you that we assembled these three-dimensional stacks of images, but that takes tens of seconds. And you can't really speed that up past a certain amount because you just don't have enough signal from the fluorescence imaging before you just get a bunch of noise. So that real-time 
target locking system that we developed really only samples that system about once a minute, which you know for certain things is fine, but there's some fundamental speed limitations that are going to prevent us from going significantly faster. And one of those is the fact that in order to move the microscope stage, to move the objective to refocus, it's going to take a few milliseconds to physically move the mechanical parts of the microscope. So even if we didn't collect any data, didn't collect any image, we'd still be looking at a theoretical frame rate of a couple of hundred frames per second. And remember, you have to build up these 3D stacks by collecting a few hundred frames. So even like in an ideal case, without any noise or any imaging issues, it's still going to take tens of seconds to collect and then analyze the data from this particular experiment. But is there a different approach that we might be able to use. So this is just a two-dimensional movie looking at these particles. So there are micron in size. We put a fluorescent dye in them, and they diffuse around, undergoing this Brownian motion. To do the 3D stack, to, calculate, to collect all the slices, about tens of seconds. But this is basically real time. And I'll play this again. And you can see that things are changing, basically, at video rates. So if we need to collect a 3D stack of information, we're not going to capture any of the physics of this particular motion. So you know, is there anything that we can do? Right? So we can collect these 2D frames at video rate if we want to probe the dynamics of these 3D systems. Is there a way that we can extract that information based on just the 2D movies? All right, so let me tell you about a technique where we apply these high-speed two-dimensional techniques to three-dimensional systems. And we're basically relying on the fact that the motion itself is isotropic. So if we sample these rapid video rate sequences in two dimensions, can we reconstruct the three-dimensional motion by knowing that the x, y, and z dimensions are all the same from a physics perspective? And so this is a technique that was developed first for dilute particle systems in something called differential dynamic microscopy. And then we're applying it with different uh, imaging techniques. But the way that this works is we're going to start with images, like a sequence, a two-dimensional, call it a movie, of images of these particles and subtract pairs and analyze the leftovers from the subtraction. So let me give you an example. Here's a typical image. So the scale bar there is 10 microns. These particles are about a micron in size. And then what I'm going to do in this sequence is take the frame, the next frame in the sequence and subtract it. <clears throat> and what I've done here is set the 128 middle gray level to 0 and black as if the later image is brighter and white as if the previous one is, is brighter. And so you see this is delta t is one frame ahead. And I think this is something like 30 frames a second. And so every particle has shifted slightly. And as a result, you get sort of white and black pairs, but it's mostly gray. And then as we you go forward in time, so now I'm subtracting the frame two frames ahead, four, eight. As time goes on, you'll see that, that the particles move more from their original position. You get more structure in the image. You get more white and more black and a little bit of less gray. But eventually, so between delta t equals 8 frames and delta t equals 16 frames, the images start to look the same from a statistical perspective, because eventually the positions of these particles are just decorrelated. So after a certain point, they've diffused around, and any configuration information in the original system is lost. And statistically, we expect in the long time limit that these images will saturate to some level of structure. Now, what are we going to do with these images? Well, all right, so I'm telling you we're going to subtract pairs of these frames. And then what we're going to do is calculate a two-dimensional Fourier transform of that subtracted image and then square the result. So the Fourier transform is going to be a complex image. We'll take the complex magnitude. It'll give us a real result. And then we're going to average for all pairs at the same time separation to give us good statistics. All right? And the nice thing is this is a very easy technique when you're collecting the data because you just let the movie run longer, and you can just average over more and more frame pairs. All right, and this technique was originally uh, developed for something called differential dynamic microscopy, which we're extending, but this algorithm was published back in 2008. All right, so is this a type of thing that might be useful for GPU acceleration, and how would we go about evaluating that? Well, the algorithm that I've described, that's all there is. There's actually no fitting parameters. We just do this very deterministic set of Fourier transforms, subtractions, and averaging. So from a computational standpoint, or at least from a sort of 
idea of computation standpoint is pretty simple, right? Because these are all well encapsulated operations, right? It's well defined if I want to take Fourier transform or to subtract images or average a bunch of things, right? There's very little that requires, you know, there's nothing, for instance, that requires user input. All right, and we're dealing with an awful lot of independent data. So let's say I have a sequence of 1,000 images. My subtraction of frame 53 from 51 has nothing to do with the subtraction of frame 768 minus 523, for instance, and all the 4A transforms are independent. So it's a huge amount of completely parallelizable data operations where there are no dependencies whatsoever. So that's a good thing. The data sets that we're using, so these images are, you know, 1,000 by 1,000 or 500 by 500 pixels, so they're sort of megabyte scale images. We may have thousands to tens of thousands of them, so our data sets are looking at hundreds of megabytes, worst case, maybe a gigabyte, and this is going to fit very comfortably in the RAM of a GPU, right, with a few, you know, you need a few times the RAM of your data size, but, you know, we're not looking at something that, for instance, is 10 kilobytes, where it might not be, you know, worth doing all the data trafficking, and it's not 10 terabytes where we would have to split this up over a whole set of GPUs. So for a desktop experiment, I think this is quite nice because the types of scale of data sets are fitting quite nicely in GPU memory. And then finally, we have a lot of computational intensity. Right? So for a sequence of n images, right, I'm going to have to do n or n squared Fourier transforms and a whole bunch of subtractions. But you know, if we're looking at 10,000 or 1,000 images and we're talking about a million, tens of millions of operations, considering we're only loading a few hundred megabytes of data, that's actually a pretty good win, at least if we're looking at this ahead of time, for something that might be a candidate for GPU acceleration. All right, so what we're actually going to do is implement this in a very straightforward way using uh, some beautiful library tools that the NVIDIA groups have developed, the NPP, the NVIDIA Performance Primitives Libraries, and the CUDA FFT Libraries. And what I want to show you here, the main message here, is that we're going to do all of this using very highly optimized CUDA code without actually writing any kernels. So the NPP code is really nice because it's quite simple. So I'm showing you here, we have um, basically some setup code, and then the first thing to run the Fourier transform is literally, literally at the bottom, just three lines here. So we'll load the image set things up to convert it, you know, so that the camera will collect an 8-bit integer. We, gotta, we want to convert it to a floating point, and then run the FFT, and that's just one line of code in the library. So you have a bunch of parameters, but it could hardly, from a conceptual standpoint, be any simpler. And then when we do all of these subtractions, we just have um, looping, again, using these NPP libraries, so we subtract these pairs square the magnitude and then add, and that's sort of how we're doing the averaging. We'll do a whole bunch of adds and then at the end just divide. So again, these just very simple conceptual arithmetic type operations. We're looking at just a handful of lines of code. And the nice thing about the libraries is that we can leverage the resources of NVIDIA's tools groups and they optimize these things very heavily for every generation of GPU and all we need to do is leverage it in a very simple and straightforward manner. So. The code is quite simple. It's, no real, it's not even longer than the MATLAB code that we use to develop this. All right, so as far as the results go, this is a comparison. So we first implemented it very slowly in MATLAB and then faster on the GPU. And you can see the original uh, in the upper left from the MATLAB case and the GPU code on the upper right-hand case. The MATLAB, I think, is probably double precision. The GPU code is single precision, but it doesn't really matter. So you'll see the sort of salt and pepper color. So I've, in the lower right here, I've subtracted each of the images, and you get some noise, but then when you do the averaging, and I'll, I'll show you why we do that later, the two results are identical. So that's pretty nice. So we sort of pass the quantitative check. And then when we're looking at performance, when I run this CUDA code on the Tesla C2050 for a typical sequence of a couple thousand images, it's going to take a minute or two of total execution time, whereas the MATLAB case would take several hours. And so that's a speed up of about 50 times. And this actually matters because it brings us into a different regime qualitatively in terms of conducting the experiment. And that is what I'm going to call this interactive regime, where you get the results from the analysis back fast enough to influence the type of science you're doing in the next round. So an example is that let's say I go into the lab, I spend a few hours, I collect you know, a, a few dozen of these sequences, 
So if we're running at video rates, so, you know, how long does a thousand images take, right? Something, you know, of, of order of a minute. Well, if every one of those sequences takes multiple hours to analyze, by the time I analyze that data, it's a week later, and then, you know, things aren't so fresh in your head. And I'll show you some stuff with biological organisms. They're all dead by that point. So, you know, you sort of lose the, that real time on a sort of larger scale, or at least that interactive way of doing experiments where you get some results back and you can go back and tweak something on the microscope or you can go back and it sort of keeps it fresh, it keeps it live, keeps it in your brain and you can do better science. So this is one of those cases where from a sort of social standpoint or from the, the, the perspective of a scientist actually in the lab, the GPU makes a world of difference because then I can you know, take a, a few hours of data and analyze it, get the results back you know, sort of that day, the next day or whatever and it helps guide my thinking. So this is a, a case where it was a big payoff for the types of things that we were doing. All right, so now let me uh, get into uh, what we do with the analysis and some of the scientific results. There may be a little bit uh, of physics here, and uh, so I'm happy to take more specific questions afterwards. But this is uh, this two-dimensional Fourier transform averaged over about, I don't know, 10,000 frames or something. So in this case, this is uh, where I have the pointer. That's QX, Q0. So if you have a spatial image, right, the Fourier transform of that is going to be in the reciprocal space of the spatial frequencies. So this is now a map sort of of the intensity of different spatial frequencies in the image. And in this case, again, it's a, a separation of a certain amount of time averaged over a bunch of frame pairs. So you'll see this, and it looks basically like a circle. It's just a quadrant because by symmetry, the positive frequencies and the negative frequencies are going to be basically the same. And you can see it's a circle. So we're just going to average it over all the different orientations and essentially get a map of the spatial, the sort of the density at a certain spatial frequency, just the magnitude of that. And that's this Q axis. So it's going to be in 1 over microns, because again, the, the images are in microns. And we're calling this quantity delta. So that, that gives us sort of a measure. And this is, you could sort of look at it as a line in this direction and we're translating the heat map here just into a single stripe or a single line on the graph. All right, so this is for one particular frame separation, uh, you know, a, a separation of frames in a certain amount of time. And then what we're going to do is calculate this curve as a function of the change in time separation. So the delta t axis is along the horizontal here. So we're going to calculate this curve for every different frame pair separation. So this, this rectangle here is actually, the data in the graph here is actually the data in this white rectangle. And so you could see if we start out at delta Q equals zero and go out this way, it goes high and then low, so red and then blue, so it's sort of a standard heat map. All right, so this is now, Q is on this axis and delta T is on that axis, so we can slice the data in this blue rectangle and it leads to this curve. All right, so what we're doing here is picking a particular spatial frequency or a particular Q value and then plotting the change in this quantity, or the sort of how that the energy at this spatial frequency evolves as a function of frame pair separation, and we get this curve. So the nice thing here is that we can fit this to an exponential, so sort of 1 minus e to the delta t over some tau, and now we can do a little, just some very rudimentary curve fitting and pick out a baseline noise floor, and then an ultimate amplitude in the infinite time separation limit. And this is sort of another way of saying that after a certain amount of time, the images are totally decorrelated. So there's that power at the spatial frequency more or less saturates to a certain value. And we can also fit this for a time constant to figure out how quickly it approaches that infinite time limit. All right, so I realize this is sort of a lot of physics. And uh, so let's take a look at some of the applications. So the first thing we can do, we want to calibrate this against known data sets, is to say from these particles, OK, we can pick out from the time constant how quickly they're diffusing around. And what that gives us, so from this fitting parameter, this tau, that time scale on the exponential, we can plot it as a function of q or the spatial frequency. And that's what this data is. The nice thing is that's a very standard way to look at data for these particles that are diffusing around. And we can connect it to a technique called dynamic light scattering where you fire a laser into it and you send the output to a photomultiplier tube and you look at the correlations in the photon arrival time. And what that allows us to do is to figure out a diffusion constant of the particles. All right, so the nice thing is once you measure the viscosity of your solvent, from this you can actually measure the particle size. So the, the, the simple message in these systems is that you can just throw some particles in on the microscope, run this technique, and you get a very accurate measurement of the particle size over length scales that are actually uh, pretty large. Okay, so we can do this with different kinds of microscopes and we end up with the same type of technique. So this is just showing that we can 
accurately quantitatively measure down to sort of nanometer resolution what the size of these particles are just by looking at movies of their diffusing around. The other thing we can then do is look at the structure of these particle suspensions. So I have these particles, they're diffusing around. On average, they're spaced a certain way, and there's some theoretical physics predictions that will tell you what that is. So this is a measure of the structure factor. So if you know the positions of all the points in three dimensions, you can Fourier transform that, and you can build up essentially what, what's called the structure factor, and there are predictions for these hard sphere suspensions. The data here I'm showing you is from this technique. We can fill it in and match these theoretical predictions, and also uh, from different three-dimensional techniques. So we can go back to the traditional mode of collecting data, and you can see that uh, everything matches quite nicely. So this here is, this image is sort of an XZ slice, and you can see that we can see the particles at the top and the bottom, so it's a very nice three-dimensional image set. And I'll come back to why uh, that's important in a little bit. All right, so, so again, this may be a little bit dry in, in terms of physics, but this is basically just showing that without any parameters, we can validate quantitatively that our analysis is leading to meaningful physics. Or at least, you know, it's, it's compatible with existing theoretical predictions and other experiments to, to validate our numbers. All right, so we want to just take that as a basis and then move forward and see if we can do new kinds of physics measurements. So the first thing is we're going to try this in some messy samples where the optics aren't so good. And then the other thing is can we move beyond these sort of diffusing spheres, which again may be a little bit dry, and for instance ask questions about biology. So again, the point is to validate these techniques on sort of a perfect system in the lab where we can control everything and then maybe apply it to things that are more interesting that give us some new measurements. All right, so the first thing is looking at these samples that are a bit degraded. So this is, and on the left, I'm showing this movie where we've adjusted the chemistry so that the particles, you can see them in 3D and they're beautiful. And now what we're gonna do is try it in a case where we kind of mess up the solvents a little bit and the imaging of the particles is actually quite poor. So you can see that the particles are the same, but now they're much more blurry and the contrast is much lower on the right. And I'm showing you basically raw movies without any processing. All right, so when we look deep inside a sample, so I showed you that three-dimensional reconstruction at the beginning where you could see all the particles. In this system, because we've played with the solvent, when you go deeper into the sample, you can't see the particles anymore. And in particular, if we try to track their positions, you, you find them all at the top of the image stack. But when you go deeper and you lose contrast, you end up missing. The particle location software misses the particles. So you know, we want to now test out some of these methods so we can go back and check this structure factor. So what we can actually do is image at the top where the imaging conditions are good, but knowing that the physics itself is isotropic in three dimensions, we can actually then sort of extrapolate by understanding the system what the structure factor should be. So we apply this technique and we can see the structure factor is correct matching the theoretical prediction, but if we try to locate particles in 3D, you can see here this is an XE image, you lose the ability to see anything, and then the 3D particle reconstruction structure factor is gonna be incorrect because we just don't see all the particles. So this is the case where knowing that the physics is isotropic, we can sample and do the analysis in 2D where the imaging conditions are good and get the full 3D structure where we actually can't image the 3D behavior. All right, so taking that as a little bit of inspiration, let's go forward and look at something a little bit more new. So these are bacteria which have some genetics engineered so that they fluoresce. And we had a, the, that beautiful keynote yesterday about looking at particle motion or the motion of animals in two dimensions. So this is a case where the bacteria are swimming right near the cover slip and you can see their axes are basically aligned with or in the plane of the image. So they all look like long rods, right? So they're basically swimming in 2D. And this is kind of what I would call sort of state of the art or what most people are doing when they're studying the motion of these organisms. They do it in 2D because you can resolve them and you can see what's going on. But what happens if you want to actually do it in 3D? And in particular, again, we can't sample a full 3D stack fast enough to reconstruct the behavior. And the optics in these bacterial suspensions are not great. You know? So we can do all these games with these colloidal particles, change the chemistry, change the solvents, change the particles to engineer something that's optically perfect. But with bacteria, you know, they need food. They need oxygen. And you can't really change the chemistry basically without killing them. 
So what happens when we go deeper into the sample? Well, this is looking deep in the bulk, about, I don't know, 8, 10 microns in. And now the axes of the bacteria, which are these rod-like shapes, are not all aligned. And you see they're actually much more randomly distributed. Now, this image has a lot more noise. It's, we've tried everything under the sun to try and track the position of the bacterial techniques, and it, or the bacteria, and traditional optical flow and particle image velocimetry don't work. So we're going to have to do something a little bit more sophisticated. But what happens if we want to understand this motion? So it's a case where we can't play with the chemistry. We can't do anything really much more than this is already sort of pushing the signal to noise ratio of the microscope. You know, you can't make it any brighter to get better imaging, or the bacteria will bleach, or you'll kill them. So it's one of these situations, you know, can we use this computational approach to get us some, to, to understand some new physics because the experiment itself is kind of locked down in our, the conditions as far as the experiment goes. All right, so let's apply this technique. And now this is looking at some of those functions from the fitting. Um, and I can go into some more of the math. But if you look at the, you know, later, but if you look at the surface, this is the sort of intermediate scattering function analog, but nonetheless, you, at the, the surface, you see that these bacteria are aligned with their long axes parallel, and this function doesn't scale, right? So these are for all the different uh, spatial wavelengths, and you get a whole bunch of different data, and the function is not so simple. This would be an exponential in the case of the uh, diffusing particles, but now we don't have diffusing particles because the bacteria are swimming. But deep in the bulk, we see something quite interesting, and this particular function at all the different spatial wavelengths collapses into a single master curve, which suggests that we're looking at some interesting universal behavior. So now if we go back and fit this, this, this ends up being something called a, a stretched exponential. So if we go back to this tau of Q graph, which is again how we size the particles over here, we're now looking at the dynamics of the system. If we look at the bacteria near the surface, we get this data, and it's kind of this sigmoidal curve shape, which doesn't really tell you very much. But if we look deep in the bulk of the sample, all of these points now start to fall in a straight line, and in fact, on this log-log graph, so it's the logarithm of this tau quantity versus the logarithm of the spatial frequency, it actually falls onto a straight line with slope 1. So it's actually a linear slope. So what does that mean? That means that this motion, so this characteristic time constant, is proportional to the inverse of the spatial frequency, and that means that it's basically a linear velocity term. So what this allows us to do, which is some simple inversion, is calculate a velocity distribution for these bacteria. So this position here, the position of this line determines a characteristic velocity for this distribution, which is about 40 microns a second. And then we can actually measure the velocity distribution of these bacteria. So I mean, maybe uh, to, to explain, I think, why, why this is interesting, we can actually remember there's no fitting here. There's no user parameters. There's no segmentation. There's no tracking. Right? There's nothing that you can do to contaminate, in a way, that measurement. And so we run a very deterministic methodology in terms of the analysis, and we can actually measure the velocity of these distributions from 2D image sequences, even though they're swimming all over the place in 3D. So I think that this is kind of a new way to measure some of these quantities and actually be reassured. I mean, I, you know, that maybe that all that stuff about the diffusing spheres isn't so exciting, but at least it gives us a way to sort of validate the numbers and to get some real measurements. And so if you look at some of these biological experiments, how do you have confidence that you know, you know that your bacteria are moving at 40 microns a second versus 50 or 30? I think here's a nice way where we have a chain of validated experiments that meet all these calibration standards. And we can actually start asking now, all right, so I'm not a biologist, but now you can imagine how does the level of oxygen or the food or the temperature affect the collective behavior of these things? And I think here's a nice way that you can do it very simply, again, without a huge amount of basically no user intervention, and we get valid numbers. So I think that's uh, pretty cool for what we want to do. All right, so this publication hopefully will come out in the next week or two. I just uh, had the proof sent back into Physical Review Letters, which is the top physics journal. And I want to point out here in green Frank Yargstorf. So he's the engineer in charge of the NVIDIA Performance Primitives Libraries, which was pretty critical to everything that we're doing here. And he actually wrote our code for us, which is basically why it worked without bugs. So a big uh, thank you to Frank for that. And I think it just goes to show where if you can take some top-notch engineering, and he was with the DevTech group at NVIDIA at the time, and combine it with some science, I think by joining forces, you can end up with some things that are pretty interesting that may it basically would not be possible if either group sort of stayed separate. So I think this is sort of a shout out for the importance of interdisciplinary collaboration. All right, so that's the, uh, the big physics story. The second story I want to tell you 
is uh, how we can improve tomography by using high dynamic range imaging. So this is uh, in collaboration with a group at the Biopic Center at Peking University in Beijing. And it was great because I actually visited them after GTC Asia, and that was sort of a springboard to get this project moving. And what I'm going to tell you here is about how we're using Tesla and CUDA to improve the fast 3D visualization of live organisms. And it's, again, part of this theme where, especially in biology, you have experimental constraints and how you can use more computational power to get really good science or physics out of it or imaging or whatnot when you have to sort of adapt the computation to the experiment because you can't really change the experiment very much. All right, so this is the traditional optical projection tomography setup. So you have some sample here in the center. You rotate it, and then you capture uh, images by uh, basically Im the light that's gone through the sample. So this basically works with uh, transparent samples. And so before everything I was telling you about in the microscope works on micron scales, this is something that's much more millimeter scale. So we can take, for instance, a zebrafish, which we'll see a lot of in the coming slides. All right, so if you want to look at the features inside, say, a zebrafish that is transparent, the tomography is good, but there are some issues. So here we've put a dye in that stains the blood vessels. Another, you can stain the cartilage. At the lower left, you can sort of clear out all the fluids and put another one in. But the problem is it's very difficult to image the entire fish because you have regions of very strongly differing transparency. So if you look through a thin part, maybe you know, in the tail or something, you can see all the structure. But at that amount of illumination, no light's going to get through the head. And if you properly expose for the head, you're going to totally burn out uh, something that's, say, in the tail. So the limitations of traditional optical tomography, in this case it's projection tomography, is that if you really want to make the sample completely transparent, this sort of BABB clearing I showed in the previous slide, you have to kill the fish. So that's fine if you want to study it when it's dead, but what if you want to understand something going on if it's alive? Again, you can't really do very much chemically to a living organism to improve its optical transparency properties without killing it. Right? So that's a, a big question, right? How do we sort of get around that? And then, as I mentioned, you've got a tremendous amount of difference in both scattering and absorption in a living organism. So imagine you know, looking through a thin part of a fin versus the head, and there's not enough dynamic range in any one particular CCD to capture all of that. And this is sort of the, the reason behind the development of high dynamic range photography. So why not take that idea of HDR and apply it to projection tomography? So here's a case now. So instead of taking one picture per angle and rotating the sample, at every angle, we're going to take a bunch of different shots at different exposures and then combine them in a, in a traditional HDR framework and then use that as the input to the optical projection tomography. All right, so let me give you some examples of how we do that. This is, again, a typical setup. So the setup really isn't any different from tomography, any sort of regular tomography. So if you, you have or are working with one of these, it's pretty easy just to adapt the algorithm of what you're doing to improve the data collection without having to do any hardware changes. So this is just a pretty standard rotating the sample, a big uh, lens and camera, and some illumination. All right, so let's, let's start out with an example of all these different exposure times. So we're looking at a zebrafish. And at 10 milliseconds, you get some, some structure here in the very thin parts of the embryo, but the head is completely opaque. And what I'm going to do is just increase the exposure time here at 50 milliseconds, 80 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds. So now we're 10 times, and you can barely see through the head. But now, you know, for instance, the body is more or less burned out. And by the time you get to 300 milliseconds, which is what you need to see all of the structure inside the head, you don't even know that the animal has a tail. Right? So, so this is clearly, if we want to capture all of the structure in the organism, there's just no way to use a single exposure time. All right, so what we're going to do is combine these into an HDR, or high dynamic range, image. So I'm starting out at a given angle here with all the different exposure times. The first thing we're going to do is threshold and wipe out anything at the sort of very upper end of the range because the camera has some nonlinearity in the brightest pixels. So we're just going to wipe all that out. So all of this white area now just gets masked out. And then I'm going to divide by a you know, function of the exposure time to get a proportional image, right? So sort of the number, the intensity of the image is basically linear with the number of photons hitting. And then we'll pick the areas in each of the images that sort of have the right gray values that we want to put together. And so that's sort of masking out the other pixels. And then it finally lets us create this high dynamic range image. So here you've got features from the tail and the head. And that's just not possible with a single exposure time. Now the nice thing about this high dynamic range uh, 
image is that now you have many more bits in the input image and you want to generate, say, an 8-bit output image, you have a lot of flexibility in changing the curves. And this is sort of basically a gamma function, right? So uh, if you do it in linear, it's a little bit pasty. And now you can play around with different curves. And finally, say, in this curve number four, you have a beautiful way to visualize the structure inside the head and the spine all at the same time. And we're just taking sections here. So I'm going to show you a few more images of this technique working. So again, now we're taking different sections of the zebrafish. And the conventional OPT is just picking a particular exposure time. So say here in the tail, as you increase the exposure, uh, you, know, you can see only certain parts of it. And then when you uh, clear it out, so this technique that you kill the animal and then drain its fluids to make it more transparent, you do pretty well. But compare, you, know, you can compare the sharpness of the features. And in the high dynamic range image at the end, you can see that we have by far the best quality. All right, so just to step through this a little bit more explicitly, uh, now a section through the head and through the body at different exposure times, you capture different features. Oops. Um, let's try this again. Yeah, so you capture, you know, so when you have a lot of exposure, you can capture the really dense parts of the head, but you don't even see a spine at the bottom. And then uh, by the end, you can capture the spine, but now the head is opaque. And so with the HDR, you get all the structure in the head, and you can capture all the vessels and stuff in the, the, the bones and the cartilage in the, the body itself. All right, so let's, we can zoom in and look at some particular features. So again, when we have so much light going through that we only see the head, then there's no body whatsoever, whereas in the HDR image, you can actually see all the, the small structure. And you can look at this more explicitly in parts of the tail here, whereas in the original sort of bright image, there's no tail whatsoever. And then we can zoom in and resolve much more finely the structure and the features by combining all of this information from both multiple angles and multiple exposures. All right, so if we want to apply this to a scientific question, this actually allows us to image and visualize fish with different mutants. So now what we can do is say, OK, we're going to play around with the genetics a little bit. So we'll start out with this wild type, which is the regular zebrafish. And then the scotch tape zebrafish, we're going to knock out one of the genes. And we can now image the morphological differences as a result of playing with the genetics. So let's take a look on the backbone here. And uh, V is for vein and A is for artery. So we're looking at the structure of certain blood vessels. So this is the conventional optical projection tomography image here. And this is the HDR. And you can see that it's much clearer here in the HDR version. So in this mutant, we're supposed to see that the vessels get thinner and much more convoluted. And so I think if you compare this image at the far right, here you can see these veins and arteries are thinner. And they're certainly much more distorted and wavy. And I think that's very clear in the OPT, in the HDR image. But if you look at the conventional image, it's really not so clear because when it's blurred out and you can't see those features, it's very difficult to image the differences in these genetics. So I think here's a case where moving to this HDR approach actually allows us to visualize differences due to genetics in the resulting morphology of the fish that if you stick with the conventional optical projection tomography approach, you just won't see. And you know, here, I should, I should mention, uh, like several of the other talks here in terms of tomography, uh, the GPU is being used for the tomographic reconstruction, and it you know, makes it you know, orders of magnitude faster. And I think you know, what's interesting here is sort of not just doing the execution on CUDA, but trying to think sort of in this imaging context, what can we actually do that gives us better data that allows us to do better science? And in this case, the, the GPU reconstruction certainly enables that. All right, so this paper has been published uh, earlier this year, uh, about a month or so ago, in Optics Express. And here's the reference. So this, again, I didn't do most of the, exper uh, the experimental work. That was all done at Peking University in this biopic center. So I'm basically presenting the work that, that they did there. All right, so the third story that I'm going to tell you about is the detection of low cost, uh, a low cost, robust way to detect contamination in the third world. And so yeah, we hear all this stuff about uh, sort of putting compute in the cloud. This is sort of the idea that well, maybe you don't need a huge amount of computation, but are there situations where just a little bit of compute power can actually change things a lot because that computation is ubiquitous? So with Tegra, right, you have this ARM engine with a GPU. It's, it could be everywhere. It's low power. And the question is, can we use this to protect the safety of food and medicine? So what's the problem here? You know, can we use this ubiquitous mobile computing to save people's lives? 
Well, let's think about it. It's 2012, and yet we still have food poisoning killing thousands and sickening millions, right? I mean, even in America, right? There's something at the salad bar. You get some E. coli, some old people or some children die, right? There's E. coli or salmonella in meat, eggs, and milk. And, I mean, from a technological standpoint, this is kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, here we are talking about all this, you know, computational power, looking at the H1N1 virus or whatever at the single atom level, and yet, you know, people are still dying because they eat bacteria. I mean, in a way, it seems kind of stupid that this is really still happening today. Like, this should be, at least as a physicist, this is a solved problem, right? Why is this still going on? And, you know, there, there's also the issue of product contamination. So... You know, before there was this melamine and baby formula just a few years ago, but even in the last decade, there's examples of kids, you know, you get cough syrup and they've basically substituted ethylene glycol or diethylene glycol, which are toxic, in cough syrup or toothpaste, which use polyethylene glycol or propylene glycol and they're more expensive. So, you know, whether it's mislabeling or it's intentional to save costs, I mean, that's sort of a separate issue. But, you know, you've got these epidemics where hundreds of kids are dying in third world countries because their products are contaminated. Again, this is stupid, right? We could have detected the difference between ethylene glycol and propylene glycol 100 years ago. And yet, you know, people are still dying by the hundreds. And then what about unsafe drinking water? Well, there's still cholera epidemics, say, you know, in Haiti after the earthquake or other places, right? There's, like, these guys swimming around. And again, you know, you can take this to a lab and get the complete family history of all of these organisms from their genetics. They've all been sequenced. So why in the world is this still happening today? Well, I think part of the problem is that traditional laboratory testing is just too expensive, so if you look at scientific equipment, right, let's say I want to do this complete family history of this particular bacteria sample, well, I need a stable laboratory environment. That's going to require mechanical, electrical, and thermal stability, which you kind of take for granted if you're in an academic environment because the janitor's closet sort of has all of this. But if you're out in the third world and there's not resources there, then maybe there's no electricity, or electricity only runs t two hours a day, you actually don't have these sort of basic minimum stability conditions to have a laboratory. The apparatus excel itself is pretty expensive. Is it you know ten to the fourth, ten to the fifth do dollars, right? Ten kilodollars, a hundred kilo, hundred thousand dollars, right? These techniques, which are long known, UV visible absorption, fluorescence, gas chromatography, mass spec, all this genomic tools, they're sort of designed by companies to have a nice margin when they sell them, and so they're not cheap. You know, a, a lot of these assays for enzymes, you know, they're going to require a continuous refrigeration chain for the chemicals, which is not going to help you if you're in Haiti after the earthquake and you just want to know whether this water is drinkable or not. Uh, for, uh, to do a lot of this analysis on microorganisms, you may need to incubate or grow them up and do some chemical reactions, and that's going to take some time. And then finally, which I think we take totally for granted in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of places where it's just almost impossible to find enough trained operators to run these tests. Even technicians, you know, need to have experience and training to do this analysis. All right, so how do we think about this a little bit differently? How do we, for instance, you know, take out all the stuff we don't need so we can do these measurements and maybe cut costs by orders of magnitude? So we're not looking to, like, okay, how do we shave 10% off of this? But, you know, how do we get this testing cheap enough that it can happen all over the world and in a way where there might not be infrastructure and there might not be very much money? Well, first of all, a lot of these laboratory instruments are very general, right? You need to be able to detect a host of reaction products, do a whole bunch of different chemistry. You want one instrument to serve a wide variety of purposes. But if we're asking, okay, we just want a technology that's going to work to get us the measurement of this contamination, we can start to make a lot of compromises. So first of all, we're going to do uh, some illumination, so absorption and fluorescence, but we can tune the chemistry to work with particular colors so we can fix a certain wavelength of light versus having to build a spectrometer and all these other things with crazy moving parts to change wavelengths. We can just pick a color. And then what we want to do is use modern mass production techniques to really drop the cost of this, not just from you know, $100,000 to $1,000, but can we you know, cost, cause this thing to cost a few tens of dollars to build, for instance? So we'll, we'll see what we can do as far as dropping the cost of manufacturing. And then here's, I think, the key for this audience is instead of having custom hardware to run all the optomechanics and the analysis, can we move all of the compute off the device itself and say hosted in a, a Tegra or something like that. So we're going to use our, the Tegra to handle the analysis of processing the communication, etc. All right, so this is our little setup here. We're going to do 
an absorption experiment, so we're going to use an enzyme that has a chemical reaction, and as that reaction progresses, it's going to create a chemical that absorbs light at a particular wavelength. So the light's going to be provided by simple LED, which in this case is in the UV, and then we're just going to detect it with a photodiode, and then we're going to control the output of the LED or the, because you know, temperature is going to change. We're going to regulate that with an op amp to hold its output light level constant. And then because we want to improve the spectral sensitivity of the illumination and detection, we only want to pick out a certain wavelength, we need some filters. So we found that you can actually get theater lighting gels, so they use it for different colors, and they actually have very well-defined wavelength absorption properties, so you can actually test out a bunch of them and for a fraction of a cent get a pretty workable filter. All right, so we've got uh, a D to A to run the light level of the LED illumination. We have an A to D to collect the data from the photodiode. That's just going to go to a microcontroller, and we're just going to send that raw digitized data out to the Tegra to do some analysis. And in this case, I'm just, um, yeah, all right, so the, the dumb circuitry just collects the data, right? So the microcontroller, some D to A's, some A to D's, voltage regulator, USB interface to send the data out, and that's it. So this is really cheap, right? We, these are just discrete components that don't really cost any, don't cost very much money to make. All right, so what happens if we mix now uh, different solutions of ethylene glycol? So this is something that if you drink it, it's poisonous, and it has leaked into drinking water supplies and IV fluids and such before. So what we're going to do is just put a certain amount of this, so in this case it's 100% ethylene glycol, put some enzymes in there, and then watch how over time the voltage at the detector, so again, we're illuminating with UV light, the reaction's going on over time, and we see that the voltage detected at this photodiode detector goes down as there's more absorption of that UV light. All right, so I, I've plot the logarithm of the time there, and then this is just the raw digitized 16-bit voltage signal. So there's really, not, uh, really nothing complicated here. So this is 100% ethylene glycol, and as we decrease the concentration, 69, 42, 19, 10, all the way down to 1%, and then a tenth of a percent, you can see that in all cases, this is sort of a double a, a log, log plot, so it's a log of the time and the log of the voltage, these things fall in a straight line, and that's something that, that forms a power law. And in this case, you can fit that line, and you can see that the slope of that line, which is basically a power law exponent, changes as a function of concentration. So now we can plot that for the different concentrations of ethylene glycol, and here's it, it's in water, and you can see that we have a very nice monotonic relationship between the concentration of ethylene glycol and this, this exponent of this power law. So we do this with ethylene glycol in water, which is nice if you want to do drinking water, but what about all these products? Well, the first thing we can test is antifreeze, because that's basically ethylene glycol, so it's sort of the 90% and the 45%, and that falls very nicely along the curve. But what's really cool is that we can do it with a whole bunch of different products, cough syrup, toothpaste, allergy syrup, paracetamol or Tylenol syrup. And so these are all these different materials, and you have to be very careful when you're doing these contamination studies, because if one of these things has a component that interferes with your enzyme chemistry, you're going to get a bad measurement. But here, what's really neat is that with this analysis, all of the different products fall on the same master curve. And so it doesn't matter what chemical or what product you're looking to measure ethylene glycol in with this assay, you can actually quantify it down to well below this tenth of a percent that is the limit that the Food and Drug Administration defines as safe. So basically any product, if we're looking for detection of, we can actually detect, and we don't have to know, we don't have to develop special chemistry product by product. So this universal scaling is really important. And this is quite relevant because what I'm plotting here are the deaths that have happened over the last 30 years in poisoning epidemics, and I've color-coded the bars here to correspond to the product that I've put in the key. But you can see that basically, even above sort of the 1% level, all of these things, if there had been something like this to detect, we might have saved, I mean, look at the scale here, hundreds of deaths, and these are mostly kids and elderly and the sick. So I think this is a case where putting computation out there really might have some impact in trying to save people's lives. All right, so the cool thing about all this low-cost technology is that we can actually add some more colors, right? So we have this one LED and a detector, but because these things cost so little, we can keep adding them, actually. So I'm going to add a second channel with a green LED, and it'll detect the absorption from that. But we can also do a fluorescence detection, which means I put this detector over here with a different filter. So if we use a particular dye, we'll excite it with green light, and it'll give off red light, and we can detect that as well. So we have this way to do this multi-channel detection at several wavelengths, all at very low cost. And again, all these things are just D to A's and A to D's. The dumb circuitry stays the same. And we're going to rely, again, on the external processing of the Tegra. In this case, it's really just an ARM core doing a standard analysis. But the point is it can all be done very simply on a mobile phone. 
All right, so going back to what I said at the very beginning, we're we do this uh, mechanical design on SolidWorks, and so I'm using my Quadro FX5800 for that, and you can see the renderings here, which I've done using bunk speed shot uh, on the Tesla C2050, and you can see that it's just this plastic housing, which can be injection molded for a few cents, just LEDs, these little photodiodes, little pieces of theater gel plastic, and a glass tube. So there's really nothing here in terms of costly apparatus, and we can get you know, a lot of good results in terms of the signal on that absorption. But what about the fluorescence? How do we compare to, oh yeah, here's a photograph of the whole thing built. So this is really ugly. This is just our prototype board. But this thing is, you know, easily held in your hand. And this is, you know, an inch across or whatnot. So it's, it's very small and portable. It doesn't have any moving parts. It runs on solar cells or batteries or whatnot. But I think, you know, we tried to design this to be effective. All right, so the first thing we want to know is for this fluorescence, how do we compare to commercial instruments in terms of sensitivity? What we're doing here is a fluorescence assay to measure glucose concentration. So it's just sugar, and you can see down to 10 micromolars. This is our device. This is a commercial plate reader that costs, you know, X many tens of thousands of dollars, and we get basically the same sensitivity. So that's good, that for our particular purpose, as long as we pick one particular wavelength, we can actually do as well as the commercial instruments for three orders of magnitude less in terms of cost. All right, so now what we want to do is, you know, what can we detect with this? And so by combining the UV absorption and this fluorescence information, we can detect different kinds of alcohols. And so what I'm showing you here is combining the slope of that log-log plot on the UV absorption. If we look at the fluorescence, the fluorescence actually grows in a semi-log fashion. I get a slope from that. Okay, whatever. There's, there's some manipulation of these parameters, but there's really not much in terms of fitting. Again, very little user input, and all of this falls out. And the nice thing is you see all of these different alcohols that we can detect above basically part per billion level. Right? This isn't just like, okay, I can detect 10%. We're down here like tens of parts per billion. So that's a very sensitive contamination detector, and they all fall on the same master curve. The other thing we were able to do is test this out in blood serum. So, for instance, if you want to measure a blood alcohol level, here's a case where, you know, it's like a few tenths of a percent or something is legally drunk. That's up here. We've got two or three orders of magnitude more sensitivity, and even though there's other stuff in the blood alcohol level, we can still pick it out with this, this chemistry. And again, you know, our chemistry, we've been using common enzymes that are stable for weeks without refrigeration. It costs just a few cents. So we, I think, hopefully have dropped the cost on this by a lot. All right, so that also allows us, based on the, some of the numbers, to identify the number of carbons in the alcohol so we can actually do some chemical ID. This is just sort of me having fun, I guess, as a physicist, because you, know, you want to be able to know what you can measure. But what about some of these practical problems in microbial contamination? So what we're doing here is an assay using something called a DNA intercalator dye. And so what that does is it's a dye that lights up when it finds some DNA. And this sounds really stupid at first glance compared to this complicated molecular biology assays where they can identify the particular species and the variant. But, you know, why not apply it to a situation where you have DNA where there isn't supposed to be any? Like if you drink water, there shouldn't really be any DNA in there unless there's something alive. So it turns out that a lot of these contamination issues are kind of dumb in that way. Right? Like, there just shouldn't be any. So here we're, we're dealing uh, with cholera and water, and then we can do the same thing, E. coli in water, E. coli in milk, and salmonella in egg white. And you can see in all these cases, we look at sort of the long time limit of what the, the absorption and fluorescence levels are, and you can manipulate them in some combinations. But again, we get something close to a master scaling, so it doesn't really matter what's in there. If there's a lot of DNA, that means that there's something living in your water or your milk that you probably don't want in there. And at least it would tell you at a very rudimentary level, don't drink this. So I think this is a case where you know, you've got a low-cost, rugged device. You're in a disaster situation. I don't need to know exactly how many bacteria are in this water. I just need to know to tell the people, don't drink out of it. So we were thinking you know, maybe this is the type of device you can throw in the back of a Land Rover right after a disaster. And you don't necessarily need it to be accurate. But if it crosses a threshold, you can tell people, don't drink out of this well. Wait for water to arrive. And you know, it's kind of dumb. But maybe for 10 bucks, you could save 100 people's lives. So that's, I think, where we were going with this. And then finally, last bit of data I'm going to show you is, well, what about a model for malaria? So malaria is this parasite that infects red blood cells. But red blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they don't have any DNA. So we tried to make a little bit of a model for this where we have red blood cells. And here you can see a very low level, irrespective of the cell concentration. And then instead of using live malaria, we just tried yeast because it has a similar amount of DNA just to see what we could detect. And so here's yeast at different concentrations with this DNA dye. And the nice thing is when we mix them, you have very little interference. So again, this is just a preliminary model. 
but maybe you could use some technology like this. Imagine, you know, and, and I mean, malaria is a huge area of research, and people are, are infinitely more sophisticated than we are. But, you know, maybe some kind of dumb solution might work, you know, if you can do it for a few cents and you could screen. And I think you know, a lot of work needs to be done. I'm not going to, I mean, this, you know, the molecular biologist, the, the cellular biologist might have all kinds of problems with this. But, I mean, just the idea, right? Can you get something low cost out there in the field and do very simple measurements? And in doing so, maybe save you know, the lives of people that really can't afford better healthcare or diagnostics. All right, so this has been submitted uh, to AIP Advances and some food and agricultural chemistry journals, and we're still waiting to hear about that. But, so this is all under review. All right, so let me just uh, conclude with a final slide here about how we feel that GPUs are helping us improve our experiments in terms of science and engineering. So in terms of some of the themes, like performance per dollar with Tesla, we'll be able to take our experiments and move them into this interactive regime where the analysis is comparable to the collection time. So I analyze the data. It's comparable to how long it takes to collect the data. It lets me move forward in improving the data collection by keeping it sort of fresh in, in my mind and, and live and real. And, you know, this is an effective, useful speed limit now that's affordable to consumers, right? So before, if I had to go to a cluster and wait a week and batch a job, it's not going to allow me to sort of iterate how I collect the data to improve it. And now you can, it's, as, as they say, the democratization of supercomputing and bringing it to the lab to where the data is allows us, I think, to make much more effective use of the analysis. In terms of performance per watt, this is where Tegra comes in in a sort of different limit. It's the opposite limit of these gigantic clouds. How little power can we get away with to do the minimum amount of computation to deploy it in situations where some computation is enormously better than no computation, right? So for instance, this low cost detection where just a little bit of analysis, a little bit of measurement might save the lives of hundreds of people who are kind of dying for a dumb reason from a technological standpoint, right? We, we really, as a society, should have solved this. And then finally, I think what's interesting about Quadro is sort of visualizing this new industrial revolution. So say precision manufacturing, rapid prototyping, it's bringing manufacturing and prototyping into this interaction, interactive regime, right? So I can now build a structure, design an experiment, send it to 3D print, bring it back, run the experiment, and I can actually iterate the apparatus as I iterate the experiment. And that's been a huge help to us in terms of improving the quality of the data and actually getting to some new kinds of science. So with that, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you all for coming, and I'm happy to take questions. OK, thank you very much. Very exciting. Um, any questions from the audience? OK, so maybe let me start. So um, I'm very excited about this last opportunity that you talked about. So you're saying now you can also use your smartphone in the end to test if you are uh, able to drive after you have drinking, uh, have a couple of beers, or so how does this work? So you have to pull yeah, so in you this. need to do a little bit. I mean, this is, again, I'm a physicist, right? Yeah. And when we do sort of biology and chemistry, sort of physicist style biologist and chemistry, which is kind of ignoring certain practical details. So in this case, um, you would need to be able to take the serum. I mean, you basically have to draw some blood. Yeah. But, so how, but much, how much do you need for oh, not the much. test? I mean, we're talking, you know, just a few drops. But, okay. You know, but there's a lot of sort of device engineering to, that needs to be done to make that practical. But what's really interesting, actually, so we have some in interest uh, just talking to people that are in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Because when you take a breathalyzer test, yes, people that's... that doesn't necessarily stand, like lawyers challenge that. Yeah. And then like they don't want their client to go to the hospital to get a full blood test. But this is a case where if the police could draw a little bit of blood, mm -hmm. you know, we can identify alcohol levels to parts per, you know, tens of parts per billion. Right, so there's going to be no ambiguity if it's above or below yeah. uh, sort of a tenth of a percent. Mm -hmm. And so this is a case where you know, this is sort of beyond my ability to bring to market type of sure. thing. But I think it actually, you know, we're trying to use this compute, this distributed compute to mm -hmm. work on applications that might actually help society. But you, you had this prototype built and, and this is working like... Oh, works this, great, yeah. yeah we're, cool. we're actually, we're trying to license it. I think the problem yeah. with this, all of this low cost detection field is that companies feel that there's not enough profit in it. Yeah, but I mean, I think it's sort of, you know, if you look at a more like a razor blade model, right? Yeah. So this detector thing costs, you know, $10, $20. But, you know, maybe you could sell an enzyme pack for five cents a piece. But, mm -hmm. you know, what I think the real potential impact in this is, say, agricultural testing. You know, foods, medicines, nothing is tested when it comes into our borders, like in America, anywhere. It, it's estimated that 25% of all pharmaceuticals, like medicines, are fake, mm -hmm. right? Because there's just no testing. And, you know, then you read about, again, like people dying because of, you know, they didn't wash the E. coli off the scallions or whatever in America, right? And so I think this is a case that we can drop the cost by that many orders of magnitude. 
that there's a huge opportunity to hopefully revolutionize the safety of our food chain even, our food supply and medicine supply. And so we're happy, you know, we'd love to work with anybody that, that is interested in bringing this uh, to fruition because it sort of requires the resources beyond some individual lab researchers. Yeah. I mean, on the other side, as you mentioned, nowadays with 3D printing, maybe you can, you know, pull it out and have it like a do-it-yourself kit or something like yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you're manufacturing these things in quantity, though, right, with the electronics, yeah, and, sure. uh, and yeah. if you're making tens of thousands of them. Yeah, we need 3D printers that also can do, like, circuits. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. All right, so thank you. Oh, thank you very much.